this evening, we are examining informal diplomacy in which non-officials, academic scholars, retired civil and military officials, public figures, and social activists engage in, a, in dialogue with the specific aim of conflict resolution or confidence building. Although track two diplomacy is, may not seem as important as track one, it can at times be more effective. In fact, its informal nature is often an indication that the issues in question are deadly serious. Leaders of Iran and the United States have both used war posturing for political means, and the olive branches of track one have included axis of evil and death to America rhetoric. Uh, there are some examples of um, official cooperation between the two countries, but by and large, there is a big diplomacy gap to fill. Unfortunately, insofar as a diaspora can help create positive change back home, the Iranian-American community has been debilitated by three factors. One, the U.S. sanctions, which are quite broad, preclude um, U.S. citizens from doing anything with Iran, including direct support of NGOs. So today, only U.S. government or its licensed entities can legally fund NGOs in Iran, occasionally putting those NGOs at risk. Two, the war of words between their adopted home and their native land, this is, I'm talking about the diaspora, has left many in insecure territory, leading them to um, retreat and keep a low profile, sometimes downplaying their Persian identity. You know, when mom and dad fight, the uh, stakes for taking sides become really high. Having come from, and, and three, having come from a closed society where political thought and political activity were uh, punished um, by, you know, resulted in government-sponsored kidnapping and torture and death, um, many diaspora members have carried their fear here and have chosen uh, to keep, keep a low profile and have been reluctant to get involved, especially given the two items I already mentioned, the sanctions and the stigma of access of evil. In spite of limitations, there, have been, uh, there has been progress. Uh, in addition to the back-channel diplomacy efforts represented here tonight, there have been many educational and exchange efforts spearheaded by universities, think tanks, and other nonprofits uh, that in the words of Ali Nasr, who's on the stage here, puts, uh, put cartilage between the bones and enrich track one. I think this is a very critical point. Some examples include the Iran Democracy Project at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, Middle East Program at Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson Center for National Scholars, Center for National Studies at MIT, the Pluralism Fund, and uh, the efforts of these groups have included um, conferences and educational seminars, offering, uh, often bringing scholars from Iran, um, sometimes hosting them as fellows, publishing books, writing op-eds, white papers, and so on. Other track two efforts have included international visit, visitor exchanges and citizen exchanges. Some of these are fac facilitated by the State Department. For example, roughly um, 175 people have been brought here from Iran since uh, 2006, November of 2006, less than two years ago. Sports diplomacy uh, involving boxing, um, weightlifting, water polo, fencing and wrestling. So US teams having gone to Iran and, and American um, uh, teams, uh, you know, and vice versa, traveling both ways. And then there have been joint degree programs, for example. These are arranged directly between universities who obtain OFAC licenses on their own, but the State Department, again, does a lot of facilitation, because without the State Department, visas, for example, would be impossible since there's no American embassy in Iran. So a couple of examples of these joint degree programs are Indiana, Purdue, and University of Tehran's engineering program, and UC Davis and Sharif University's MBA program. These joint degrees are really interesting because they they um, are designed in a way that essentially pe people have to spend uh, two years in Iran and two years uh, in the United States. So they're required, they're set up that way. There have also been efforts directed at journalists within Iran. For example, there's a weekly online journal called Washington Prison that some of you might be familiar with. They translate 
US news headlines, say from Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, et cetera, into Persian so that journalists within Iran have access to this information um, quickly and that they're not just relying on conservative spinning and translations by government papers. So the journalists can take those and write articles um, in newspapers. And then there are scholarships programs, a um, couple of these to mention. One is Institute for International Education, the organization that's responsible for Fulbright scholarships, for example. Just in the last two years, they've brought 50 um, students from Iran, so it's fabulous. The Homeland Security checks these people out, State Department gets visas for them, and they come here. So a lot of things happening sort of quietly, <laughs> um, but very effectively. Um, our Family Foundation has supported economics, postdoc, and um, PhD students coming from Iran at Oxford, University, University of Chicago, and other institutions. In the last few years, Persian New Year is being recognized around the United States. For example, there are annual celebrations at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, at San Francisco City Hall, and this year at the White House, where Mrs. Bush invited 40 members of the diaspora for tea this uh, past March. All of these efforts have been have benefited from philanthropy. Notably, uh, for example, Washington Prisons, Prism's multi-million dollar budget is supported by one American philanthropist, Lynn Strauss. It's quite commendable given that, given that it's really mostly under the radar and she really doesn't want any, um, any <coughs> high profile for it. I think we will see a lot more of these contact points and track to uh, efforts because A, war is too expensive and too unpopular. Two, the sanctions have not been effective for many reasons. I'm sure we'll hear more about that later. Um, a recent paper co-authored by a Rockefeller Brothers Fund advisory trustee says that any sanctions are useful insofar as they induce the punished party to negotiate. Uh, sanctions without an opening for discussion can't lead anywhere. So I think that's, that's very true. And thirdly, the diaspora, the Iranian-American community is um, finding its voice. So the 30-year-old immigrant, you know, the mass exodus happened the last in, in the 70s, in the late 70s, and that 30-year-old immigrant group is maturing and becoming more philanthropic um, and much more active. Recently, we founded the Parsa Community Foundation to get the Persian community to give more, to give more strategically, and to become more civically engaged. Parsa can help track two efforts with the, uh, with the Iranian-American community, with NGOs, inside and outside of Iran with innovative social entrepreneurs, diamonds in the rough, as Jane put it this morning, that need critical funds to push their ideas forward. So there's a lot we can, as philanthropists, do to help. One, we can float the idea that uh, the uh, sanctions against Iran should be lifted regarding NGO support or regarding philanthropy. So this would allow, essentially, um, all American citizens, not just the US government, to be able to support NGOs inside Iran. That unleashes the power of the diaspora, who today would have to, if they sent money to Iran, it would, have, it would be an illegal act. They can't do that. So I think we would be really smart to, um, to empower the diaspora to be able to do this legally and to be able to support NGOs. Two, we can consider partnering with existing Persian NGOs that can navigate the cultural nuances. I think. Uh, a lot of foundations have worked with a lot of individuals, but there's some worthy foundations out there that we can partner with. I think that would be great. Um, we see at Parsa, we see innumerable um, opportunities to fund um, programs that we can't come to close to funding. Um, they're in every area that you would be interested in, from the arts, sports, economic development, AIDS environment, you name it. And lastly, we can support more people-to-people -people exchanges. I'm sure our distinguished panel um, we'll have many more suggestions. It is really humbling that so many non-Iranians have committed themselves to the cause of cultural understanding and peaceful solutions, including everyone's here tonight. So thanks for your time, and I'll turn it over to... Excuse me. Thank you very much, uh, Nusheen Hashemi, who is one of the founders of the Hand Foundation. We very much appreciate the work that you're doing and your introduction to this conversation. I'm Stephen Heinz. I'm the president of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity 
to moderate this panel discussion about track two diplomacy focusing on the case of Iran. I'm going to take just a couple of moments to frame the conversation, add a few thoughts to what Nusheen has already uh, put before us, and then I'm going to engage my distinguished colleagues in a conversation for about 25 minutes, and then we'll open it up to all of you to join with us and ask questions and offer your comments. I think that for many of us in the philanthropic community, after 9-11, we had to stop and rethink what we were doing in the areas of peace and security, conflict prevention, and conflict resolution. That was certainly the case at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. And in those weeks right after the event, we engaged in a lot of soul searching and thinking about what we might do differently to have deeper impact in trying to create the conditions for peace and to try to help think about how to resolve conflicts in a way that would not uh, produce violence. As a result, we decided to refocus our own peace and security funding on two very closely linked sets of issues. First, support for new thinking about America's role in the world under the very different circumstances of the 21st century. How should we act as a global power? What should our values be? How should we project those values? What does this mean for foreign policy, for economic policy, for the tone, the style, and the content of how we project ourselves in the world? And second, how could we as a foundation with modest resources help to build deeper relationships of trust and mutual respect and understanding between the global Muslim community and Western societies like our own? And as we thought about that latter issue in particular, the case of Iran became very quickly a focus for us. Iran, after all, is a pivotal state in the Middle East a country that is two and a half size, the, the two and a half times the size of the state of Texas, with a population now that is nearing 70 million people, two thirds of whom are under the age of 30. We have thought that in the case of Iran, this is a country that is, has its roots in one of the great global civilizations. It is a country that has a continuous history of something like 2,600 years. It is a great society, a great civilization, a great country, strategically positioned in the Middle East. If you just look at all of its borders and the countries that border it, the Persian Gulf, the Caspian Sea, it is obvious what a geostrategically important country Iran really is. And yet, because of tragic circumstances going back to the Islamic Revolution of 1979 and the hostage takeover at the U.S. Embassy, the United States and the Islamic Republic of Iran have had no formal diplomatic relations for nearly 29 years. This means there is no normal connection among governments, among diplomats, among people that we enjoy with almost every other country around the world. As a result, there is a great deal of misunderstanding, misperception, just basic lack of knowledge. So, we see a country in which the U.S. and Iran share a lot of interests. If you think about where we are now, and we started thinking about this before the war in Iraq, but then after the war in Iraq, it just reinforced that now we are essentially neighbors with Iran, with 130,000 American troops in Iraq on the Iranian border. We have geostrategic interests in the region that are shared, and yet we have a number of issues in which we are in conflict, including Iran's support for terrorism, Iran's opposition to the two-state solution for Middle East peace, and Iran's pursuit of nuclear energy, which many in the international community fear is an effort to develop nuclear weapons. So this is a relationship where we have no formal diplomatic ties. We have a lot of issues in which there is the chance for very significant conflict, and yet at the same time, there is the opportunity for strategic cooperation. And in fact, in recent years, we've seen examples of both, conflict and cooperation. So for us as a foundation, thinking about that region and about the case of Iran, we began to think, what could we do in this context to try to have deeper strategic impact? And the notion of starting a dialogue between senior Americans and senior Iranians to open a channel of communication and knowledge building and insight might be a productive undertaking. And so we began to partner with uh, an organization called the United Nations Association of the USA, which is run by a very 
dear friend of mine and a retired American diplomat by the name of Bill Lures. And together, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and the UNA launched this process of a track two dialogue. It wasn't easy. We started, in the, we started literally in the fall of 2001, right after 9-11. It took us a full year of negotiation to organize the first meeting of the two delegations. And finally, in December of 2002, a group of very senior and highly respected Americans who have served Republican and Democratic administrations, who come from the academic and scholarly community, and who come from the business community, met in Stockholm, Sweden, with a group of Iranians who are scholars and academics and policy experts who also have relationships and the ability to communicate with the various power centers of Iranian political life, including the foreign ministry, President Ahmadinejad, the supreme leader Ayatollah Khamenei, and uh, former President Khatami, and former President Rafsanjani. We've now had 14 meetings of these two teams, starting in the fall of 2002. And before and after each of these meetings, our group goes down to Washington and we spend time at the State Department, we go to the White House, we go to Capitol Hill, <coughs> and we get insight from the policymakers about their current thinking about Iran. And then when we come back, we share with them the analysis and the insight that comes from our conversations. The goal of this process was to build knowledge among the participants, build personal relationships of trust and confidence in a, a relationship that doesn't exist formally, and to communicate with policymakers and policy analysts and think tank people about how we might find some peaceful ways to settle the very difficult and complex issues that currently divide our two countries. So it's been a remarkable experience. We've learned a lot. I think that it is fair to say that we've had some modest influence on U.S. policy. Our goal has been, frankly, to prevent another armed conflict in the Middle East. Our Iranian colleagues say to us that they feel that they've had some modest influence on Iran. But the issues are still very complex and very tense, as our two distinguished panelists will talk about now. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome our two panelists, two very dear friends who have just the right background and experience and intellectual capabilities to help us really sort through how this process of track two dialogue in its various forms, the kind of more policy-oriented track two that we're engaged in, and the many different activities that uh, Nusheen has just described, can contribute to a peaceful resolution of the issues that divide these two important countries and could lead to a way of emphasizing the opportunities for strategic cooperation. Jessica Matthews is the president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She also served in the Carter administration on the National Security Council and as the deputy to the Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs in the Clinton administration. Vali Nasser is a professor of international politics at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He's also an adjunct uh, fellow of the Council on Foreign Relations. Time does not permit me to give you the long version of their very distinguished biographies, but let me just assure you, and you can read them in your programs, both Jessica and Vali are uh, truly remarkable uh, leaders in the foreign policy community with publications and books that are among the most important on some of these topics. And as a note of uh, both personal gratitude and pride, I'm very happy to say that Jessica is a former member of the Board of Trustees of the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and Vali Nasser is a current member of the board. So let me uh, start by uh, turning to you, Jessica. Nusheen suggested a variety of different modes of track two activity, and I suspect that there are a number of people in the room who haven't really heard much about track two before. How, how do you define it? What is track two, and what is its value? What can it accomplish? Well, there are um, a million different manifestations of it, and anything I described in detail, somebody in the audience would say, well, what about? But the core is that the, the initiating party is non-governmental, um, and the initiating parties on both sides are non-governmental. I would say in almost any case where there's a hope for influence, it's also the case that the participants on both sides, each side knows have access to their own 
respective governments. That's what makes it worthwhile for the other side to participate. Those, to me, are the two core, the two core elements, and it can take all kinds of different um, uh, manifestations, from very highly structured ones, like the one that Steve um, has has led and described that RBF has put so much work into institutionally, um, to almost individual, non-organized efforts. I mean, I can know, for example, of at least four people, very senior, very influential, former government officials who have met in the last couple of years with the president of Syria and come back and extensively briefed parts of our government. Now, it turns out, actually, that the State Department refused to be briefed. But um, uh, um, but other parts, more open parts of the government, and, um, and the Secretary General of the United Nations. And this is, I mean, this is also unorganized, non-institutionally based track to diplomacy that's very much directed at changing US policy between the United States and Syria. So what are the p purposes, I mean, you've heard, open lines of communication when they are shut, um, generate new ideas uh, about how to approach difficult problems, um, especially very, it can be very, very technical ones. This is, Track 2 diplomacy has played an enormous role in arms control issues over the years um, in US-Soviet uh, relations. Um, or very political ones. Track 2 diplomacy was instrumental, laid the basis for the breakthroughs of the Oslo peace agreement in the Middle East. And then took Oslo and in several different um, contexts and moved it forward um, and left. Um, so, and build trust, as you mentioned, uh, and begin, to, and, and in the case of Iran, where we not only, I mean, I would say we're, it's not just zero trust, we're negative trust mm -hmm. uh, uh, situation. So uh, those are the key, I think, the key elements of it. What are the, what are the potential pitfalls of track two work? Well, the toughest, I think, is, that, is when to quit. Mm -hmm. um, that is, this is an enterprise, as your effort <coughs> suggests, that takes enormous patience. Um, and you never know when it's going to bear fruit. You never know, for example, when somebody who has spent four years going to meetings and, some, and become really invested in trying to solve a particular problem or improve a particular relationship is going to end up as president of that country a few years later. Um, and so one of the things Track 2 does is it builds constituencies for problem resolution within countries. Um, you know, jo Joe and Lai said, famously was asked at one point, what did he think of the French Revolution? And he said it was too soon to tell. <laughs> um, the, the, um, the, one of the pitfalls is to know if you're actually getting anything done, if yeah. you're making any progress. Yeah. Um, if, if it's worth the time and effort and, and, uh, that, that is being invested in it, um, in some ways, I think that's the toughest. Mm -hmm. you know, there are people cite a lot of other ones, but to me, those are, are kind of peripheral. Mm -hmm. um, two, two little anecdotes to reinforce that point. We, um, I was invited to meet with the foreign <coughs> minister of Iran when he was at the General Assembly of the United Nations last fall. And the question he put to me was, why should we continue to support this Track 2 effort? What impact has it had? You know, have you transformed American policy toward Iran? Oh, we haven't transformed American policy to Iran. But we did say, look, people are thinking about it differently. Um, the Secretary of State's you know, statement in, in the, at the end of May of 2005 was an important breakthrough in US policy, although because of the way it was delivered, the Iranians had a hard time understanding how significant it, it might have been. But the question is about the legitimacy and how, how you can demonstrate over time that it actually has some impact. So I yeah, think that's very I, important. I mean, I think from the point of view of this audience, one of the pitfalls is um, the, the difficulty of swallowing that you're, you're never going to have hard numerical measures of success. 
Um, and indeed, you're never probably going to be able to, except way back in hindsight, claim that what you did was responsible for a particular job. We can look back at the role of tractor diplomacy in the Oslo context, in the Middle East and thing, and know without any question how important it is. We can look back at Pugwash and the Dartmouth Conference and other things and know without question what an important role it played in US-Soviet arms control. But at the time, it just looked sort of like an endless slog through, yeah, exactly. through difficult um, things. So from the point of view of donors, don't expect any nice measures of, you know, <laughs> hard-edged measures of success. Right. And, and don't expect them quickly. That's, that's tough, too. But also know when maybe it's, it's time is not ripe. And maybe just one other kind of useful thing to think about is where track two isn't so good is once the framework is there, the ideas, the knowledge about where to go, implementation is for governments, mm -hmm. not for non-governments. So that, for example, the reason that there's no, basically no track two diplomacy going on in the Middle East right now is everybody knows what the, the parameters of the final settlement look like. It's just that nobody, there's no, there's no path open to get there. So there's really no role for, for track two in that context right now. Is there also a risk of multiple and confusing messages that come out if they're, you know, in the case of Iran, there have been, you know, a number of different track two projects over the years. There's still, I think, more than one, more than the one that we're involved in. And isn't there a risk that different messages are being delivered um, and heard and received, and so you confuse the situation rather than clarifying it? I don't think that's a serious one. I mean, our, and Bali can, and we'll talk about this, I'm sure, but, you know, the cost of a quarter of a century of no relations between the United States is that Washington in particular, and the United States Congress in particular, has a cartoon version of Iran. And you know, there's nobody on the US side to say, wait a minute, that's not, what, you know, that, that's just wildly exaggerated. Um, and so it's better to have conflicting views and more knowledge and more nuance and more depth than, than to be in the state that we mostly are in, which is um, Iran as this invented entity that, so I, um, I, to me, that's not a serious, I mean, that's the job of, of government and of experts is to sort out. The, mm -hmm. But more information is better than less. Mm -hmm. So, Vali, let's now turn more specifically and, and deeply to the, the case of Iran. And let's start with Iran's role in the region, in the Persian Gulf and in the wider Middle East. Why, why does Iran matter so much? Why does it matter right now? What, what are the... What are the key issues here, and why is Iran important to us? Well, some of it you mentioned. Uh, Iran is the largest country in that region with a population of 70 million in a very strategic location that connects South Asia, Central Asia, uh, with Middle East and Persian Gulf. It sits on the top of world's second largest oil and gas reserves. It is also a country that is uh, strategically very important for everything that the United States cares about. I mean, the key wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq have made Iran much more important than it was before. I mean, in some ways, we can look at the Middle East and look at the situation and think that no single country and the f future of our relations with no single country matters more than the one with Iran for our domestic politics, for our economy, for our, not, not only for our status in the Middle East, but actually for America's global uh, position. And uh, we haven't had, as, uh, as you mentioned, relations with Iran for about close to three decades. There is no country that has mattered to the United States so much about which we know so little as a people and with which our government has had no uh, relationship. And ultimately, uh, it's very clear that where the United States finds itself now are between very difficult choices. We simply cannot afford to invade and occupy a third Muslim country within the span of five years. We simply cannot afford <laughs> We simply cannot afford $12 billion a month for another 100 years. And we simply, 
but, but with that, all that said, we also simply cannot afford the, the um, status quo either, that uh, it, particularly the current Iranian leadership would snub its nose at the international community and the United States and, and uh, keep building centrifuges, etc. So I think the stakes are very high for the United States. And, and in particular, at this point in time, it's very clear that as, as a people and as a government, uh, it is our mandate to move this relationship to somewhere else than where it is now. You know, it's not moving forward where it is. I mean, you can look at Iraq last week. It's like a comedy of errors uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, Iran is very clearly, since the start of the surge, the Iranians negotiated a truce in Iraq that helped, and American commanders uh, uh, credited Iran for contributing to the quiet. Then it's the United States and its allies that disturb the peace, the truce. It backfires. They cannot dislodge Iran's clients from Basra. And then it's again Iran that is negotiated another truce. Everybody that matters to us in Iraq, friend and foe, goes to Tehran to negotiate. Our commanders are sitting in Baghdad waiting for what they come back with, and all we have left when uh, General Petraeus and Ambassador Crocker to come to Washington is to complain about Iran's bad behavior. There's no doubt that it's Iran's bad behavior in Iraq. But it's also very clear that Iranians hold a lot of the things that critically matter to us if we are to succeed in Iraq. And we right now sort of can't move forward uh, with threatening them, with sanctions, with war, uh, with our current status. So if we're going to relieve ourselves, uh, we really need to move this relationship somewhere else. And I think the value of track two is uh, essentially it's, it's an effort to explore and see whether diplomacy is possible, number one. And, uh, and then to uh, clarify, th uh, try to create an environment in which then it could at, at least be explored. Let me, let me ask you this, Fali. I didn't really know that much about Iran before I got into this. I had a kind of uh, vague, instinctive sense that this was an important place and I began to read and to learn more. But one of the things that participating in these 14 meetings has revealed to me, which I really didn't understand in the beginning, was how the, the psychology of this relationship is so important. It is very clear that Iran believes that its modern experience of relationship with Western powers now principally the United States, is an experience in which they feel that they've been humiliated time and time again over the years. We, of course, feel a sense of humiliation at the time of the hostage crisis in 1979 and 1980. How important is this uh, kind of psychological dimension or, or cultural dimension, um, the misperception of uh, not being treated as a, as a, as a a real power, not being treated as a real civilization, not being treated with enough respect. Is this an important dimension? It is indeed an important dimension, and I think it's important dimension now in particular because Iran is on a nationalist search. It, it wants to be respected as a great power uh, in the region. It wants to uh, be accorded that, that status. But the, I mean, the issue of trust was raised by uh, Jessica earlier. The issue of perceptions matters enormously. You have two countries that have not had relations. Uh, Iranian leaders don't travel abroad. They don't come to the United States in particular. Their perceptions of US motivations and interests are uh, concocted based on what they glean from statements and the like. Uh, there's hardly been any American policymaker that we know that has traveled to Iran. There were a few in the Clinton administration who were Peace Corps volunteers in Iran. But uh, the absence of knowledge essentially helps breed uh, this uh, kind of a scenario. And the part of uh, uh, the, uh, the track to effort is essentially to try to establish certain ground rules about what might be uh, an appropriate approach. Um, it's actually very telling that often uh, Ira the very first things the Iranians say, and, it, and usually these kinds of uh, conversations comes exactly through track two, is don't use the word regime in referring to us. We have a name, and number one. And number two, do not use carrot and stick. That's for donkeys. When you want to teach donkeys doing things, you use carrot and stick. Now, this suggests that even, even sort of uh, everyday parlance that our, our uh, uh, leaders use, saying the regime 
or they use that you should use a carrot and stick approach, which we think nothing of, actually uh, feel, uh, feeds the sense of uh, humiliation. And, I, and um, you know, the face-to-face the, the, the -face conversations at the NR relayed back uh, playing to this. I thought one of the most telling cases was uh, when, uh, I think, if I'm at liberty to say, when the Secretary of State asked you about why the Iranians had not uh, um, uh, acted positively on, on a key suggestion that she made, that it went exactly to the way in which she delivered it, rather than what she actually said. Mm, exactly. I want to open it up to the audience in just a moment, but we need to talk about the nuclear standoff for a moment. Yesterday in Iran was National Nuclear Technology Day, and President Ahmadinejad took the opportunity to announce that they were installing 6,000 additional centrifuges of a more sophisticated form at their uranium enrichment facility in Natanz. Jessica, do you think Iran is building a bomb or wants to build a bomb? I think Iran wants to get to the point where it has the capability to make a bomb in three months. Basically, I think Iran wants to be Japan. Um, and, it, you know, I've, I think I, in, in all the years I've worked in policy, I don't, I don't think I have ever seen um, a worse situation in the matter of U.S. policymaking, just U.S. policymaking, than our, our combination of sort of public statements and then the, the NIE, the National Intelligence Estimate, the recent one, which has left, I think, the entire American population completely confused. Um, uh, by virtue of the first sentence of the public summary mm -hmm. of, this, of this report, which is all anybody knows about it, um, which has been portrayed in the press as, and which in fact said, um, that we now judge that Iran is no longer pursuing a nuclear weapon. When what it meant was, and what they could have written, um, is that it's no longer pursuing, or it's suspended in 2003, the weaponization piece of making a nuclear weapon. There are basically two tracks you have to do to make a nuclear weapon. You have to make fuel, either highly enriched uranium or plutonium, and then you have to learn how to make the casing and the trigger and the various pieces of engineering into which you put it. And under the NPT, um, this is the Achilles heel of the non-proliferation treaty, so long as you pursue those two things separately, um, you can, in fact, be making um, highly enriched uranium or plutonium, and it's totally legal. And uh, the NPT is silent about, so long as you were not doing it um, openly, about making the And what, what the intelligence community found uh, was that in 2003, Iran had suspended this piece, but it certainly hasn't suspended making enriched uranium. And it has no use for low enriched uranium, none at all, because under contract, the Russians provide the fuel for Iran's reactor. And, you know, basically indefinitely forward. So my own view, at least, is that Iran intends, would like, if it can, um, to create a stockpile of HEUs. Mm -hmm. And I, my, my guess is, if it can, um, up at an appropriate time, resume the work on the, um, on the casing, the trigger, and stuff, um, and never put them together unless the time comes when they need to, mm -hmm. um, which is consistent with what all the Supreme Leader has, has said. But I, um, I do think that the NIE did for, uh, an extraordinary disservice both to American diplomacy and to American understanding of, of where we are. The other important thing is that Iran stopped negotiating with us, with the West, on nuclear in 2005. And since then, we've been negotiating with ourselves. And um, with the Europeans. Well, we don't like that deal. Yeah. How about this deal? Yeah. But, um, but with Iran, I mean, one thing about Iran is when they're negotiating with you, you are not in any doubt that you're negotiating. Um, and they have not been negotiating. Right. They, they said, well, you offered us, beautiful phrase, 
your former chief negotiator, you offered us chocolate for diamonds. But they haven't been trying to improve the chocolate. <laughs> um, so you know they're not negotiating. So, so we're negotiating with ourselves. Yeah. Um, and, and with our allies. That's been a big by part By ourselves, of it. That's, yeah. that's what I mean. Um, let so, me, ask, let me yeah. ask you this. Um, you know, one of the things that we hope would come out of the process we've been engaged in is some ideas, some concrete ideas. And right. one of those ideas has now been published publicly in an article in the New York Review of Books a few weeks ago, um, which offered a concept for ending the standoff on nuclear, which was, and the idea is, and this was, came right out of these discussions we've been having, was for Iran and the international community to agree to convert their uranium enrichment facility at Natanz into a joint venture, in essence, in which international technicians and Iranian technicians would enrich low enriched uranium for its domestic energy purposes with the supervision of the International Atomic Energy Agency, 365, 24-7 weapons inspectors on the ground with you know, a lot of technological uh, safeguards. It's not 100% fail-safe, as you know, and Jessica and her colleagues at the Carnegie Endowment, in my view, have done probably the most creative and, and comprehensive work thinking about how to revitalize the non-proliferation regime. What's your reaction to this idea as a way of finding a compromise that Iran might live with and that the US might live with? Well, I wish I, um, I feel, uh, again, like a dog in the manger. I don't think it will work um, because it presumes that there is a valid, economically rational reason for what they're doing. That is to say that it that there is a market for the low enriched uranium that will be produced. Um, and I don't think either the French or the Germans, which was suggested as the multilateral partners, um, would do it. Uh, unless it's as a total pretend um, operation um, because the Iranian, as you know, Steve, the Iranian enrichment operation is lousy, uh, technically. Um, so France and Germany would have to sort of, it would have to be a kind of a Potemkin collaboration. Um, and it would cost a lot. Now, it might cost less than sanctions if you could reach a deal. Um, but we have talked to the French since this came out, and they just say, no way. Well, that may or may not sit. But, but the problem is, what I think it's, its Achilles heel is, is that it sort of tears the veil off exactly what is the pretense in the Iranian enrichment program, which is that it has a valid non-weapons non purpose. Yeah. And I, I don't see how you, how you get around that. I understand the point, and Bali wants to jump in, but we, we should keep in mind, too, that <laughs> ironically, of course, it was the United States that encouraged Iran under the Shah to start a nuclear energy program in the yeah. first place. That's, that's right. Well, that's true. Actually, <clears throat> all of those the scientists who are running the program are graduates at MIT and Berkeley, and <laughs> exactly. uh, some of them are fairly westernized. Um, but I think also the, the, the part of the issue that Jessica said that we often negotiate with ourselves is that uh, you know, we sort of go at this issue as if it's about the nuclear issue. Uh, you know, for, the, for the Iranians, any kind of a movement on the nuclear issue has to be the result of successful engagement, not a precursor to successful engagement. And one of the uh, former uh, commanders of the Guard in um, the Revolutionary Guards in Iran put it as in the following way, that the United States is on a frontal attack on Iran, on nuclear issue, democracy, terrorism, human rights, we have the strongest case on uh, the nuclear issue. Either the nuclear issue has to solve everything or there is no point even talking to the US. And essentially what he says that you know, Iran has a sort of a day after problem. The day after it accepts this deal, if there is no roadmap to a normalized relations, then you know, uh, it's, it's pointless to, to make that concession. Yeah. Do we still have 15 minutes? Yeah, great. All right, let's, um, this, this, this is a hard conversation to have in one hour, and I want to thank Jessica and Vali for really helping to uh, 
focus us on these issues in a very short period of time, but I want to make sure we use the last 15 minutes for questions from the audience. And there are microphones that will make their way around. I see somebody here in the front. It's kind of hard with these lights. And if you would, when you get a microphone, stand up and just please quickly identify yourself and try to make your comment or question as succinct as possible. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Wiley Gregg. And my question is short, and that is, is there another game being played here? Are there, are, is there a greater interest in the Middle East to have us continue at odds with Iran? Could it be anything to do with oil production or anything else that, that never appears in the press? Because some of this, it, it seems hard to understand <clears throat> how the conflict could be so basic and be so long. And I know some of the history going back to the First World War, but. Mm. Is there something else we're missing? Great. I'm going to collect a few questions, so if you both would keep these in mind, we'll, we'll continue. In the back over there. Gareth Evans from the International Crisis Group. Oh, Question yes. mainly to Jessica. Look, when you're in a diplomatic hole, isn't the time-honored solution to stop digging and trying to find a way out of that hole? And isn't the reality of the matter that we all know that there's no economic rationale for an Iranian nuclear civilian fuel cycle capability. There's only a testosterone rationale, a pride rationale, an anti-humiliation rationale. They want to be up there with the big boys, as you said, with Japan. But in all my discussions with the Iranians, and I've been in and out of the country and discussing this issue in my own form of track due diplomacy with Crisis Group for a number of years, my very clear and very strong view is that they're absolutely not in any way committed to weaponizing, that they do understand that the costs way outbalance any conceivable benefit, but they're absolutely determined to acquire that capability. Therefore, what we need to do, the West, the rest of the world, is just ensure that that breakout capacity is very significantly constrained. And what we ought to be doing is negotiating what I think is a very doable deal, which has us recognizing the reality that they've inquired enrichment capability, whether we like it or not, that that red line has been crossed, and put all our eggs in the basket of ensuring a hugely intrusive verification regime which will ensure that we know exactly what they're doing, what their breakout capacity is, that we do know what we're doing on the engineering, on the weaponization side, so that there'll be no surprises there, and we have a whole bunch of not only incentives to normalize the situation, but very clear disincentives if they step one millimeter across the red line of actual weaponization. And when you put it in those terms to the Iranians, and when you took it, put it privately in those terms to the European negotiators, this is an extremely well understood and entirely sensible outcome that most people are prepared to buy into. But we can't get the Americans in particular to even get the first base of putting that negotiating position on the table. It's not just a matter of having a multilateralized facility internally. That's one small extra guarantee that would give us that they're not up to dirty tricks. What it really is is a matter of an extremely intrusive verification regime being negotiated in return for recognition that whether we like it or not, enrichment is a reality. Now, Jessica, can you respond, and Valley, can you respond very specifically to that kind of proposal, not the sort of the semi-version of it that you responded to so far? Nothing like a direct and pointed question. <laughs> and, um, I'll take one more in this first round, and let's see. There, is there a microphone back there? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Um, a much more basic question. Could you um, identify yourself, please? Uh, so, um, David Cohn, Notting Bay Foundation. Um, when you're pursuing uh, track two diplomacy, how do you vet your contact on the other side? How do you make sure that the, how do you convince yourself that the person with whom you're conducting this dialogue is actually representing the policies and the connections to the organization that you are trying to influence? Yeah, very good. All right, let's uh, start in, in whatever order you prefer. And sure, uh, <clears throat> regarding the first question about oil, Oil is very important, but I'm not convinced that uh, the current uh, state of conflict in the region actually benefits the oil companies or oil interests. First of all, uh, securing Iraq's oil would require stability there, which would require Iranian cooperation. Iran itself uh, has, can uh, be a major source of oil and natural gas, uh, and th therefore relations with Iran would help, and 
also secure, uh, uh, relations between Iran and the United States would allow for much cheaper and more direct access to Central Asian oil and gas, which would relieve the reliance on Russia. So uh, in some ways, the oil and gas argument should actually be an argument for trying to reduce conflict. And I would say, uh, to Gareth's uh, um, uh, point, I think you know, uh, uh, dramatically out of the box um, proposals, uh, I mean, has to be tested beyond what the Iranians or others would say. But I think it could dramatically at least change the, the posture and, and the many of the assumptions that at least I could say the Iranians are having about what the West and the United States is likely to put on the table. So I think in the least is that it would shake things up and it can provide for openings that then you can pursue. Um, the last question was the easiest. I mean, you, you don't know, um, but you don't whether that person is representing government. In fact, you don't expect that person to be representing government policy or that set of people. But you have to know enough about the country or the groups um, to know who they are and, and what they represent politically in, in the country and, and to know whether those individuals have access to the people in power. That's as far as, as, you, as you go. Um, if you don't know that much, you shouldn't be doing, <laughs> doing this. Um, Gareth, I, I mean, I think I agree with your, the premise of your question, which is they've gone, there's too many facts on the ground to walk back um, uh, no enrichment in Iran um, to where we hoped it would be two years ago. Um, and I also think, um, well, let me say how I think we ought to go forward. First, I think there's nothing that can be done through the remainder of this administration. There is too much active distrust and there's too much history to even try. Secondly, I think nothing should be done before the election in Iran because the only things that are likely to save Ahmadinejad, um, who's made such a mess of the Iranian economy, is either an American attack or an American embrace. Um, and so I, I would wait. But that, so that's June 09. That is fertile time for track two efforts to build some alternative way forward. At the same time, I would, I think it is important for the nuclear weapon states and Germany to stop negotiating with a partner that's not negotiating. And at the same time to do that um, in a way that does not convince Iran that we are in fact after regime change. Um, and so I think it is important for a while for us to say, OK, we get it. Uh, you've turned us down. You're in violation of Security Council resolutions. Call us when you think differently. Um, and, at that, and to use that time to do what we've failed to do so far, which is to get P5 plus 1, these six countries, on the same page about various red lines and corresponding sanctions. I mean, what, for somebody who watched the Iraqi story unfold over a decade, what was so clear um, was that whenever the P5 were in agreement, Saddam backed off. And whenever he sensed that there was wet cement in the bricks in that wall, he'd start throwing those bricks around and do it very successfully. And the story with Iran, I think, has been exactly the same. And the, you know, the, 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 as you know, I mean, the, the, the tragedy of this has been that when the Iranians were scared, the US was feeling triumphal and, and brushed off their effort. When the, the Europeans were ready to do serious negotiating, we, we withheld the one element that could possibly have made the negotiation successful which was a commitment to say, we'll accept the following deal. And so the Iranians had no reason to negotiate. Um, I, so what I'm saying is, is, I think the tactics from here to there are terribly important. I do think that likely, uh, 
Well, let me just say the one other thing that we have to understand um, about what's happened is that we have immensely empowered Iran in the last six years. We removed their two most serious feared opponents, the Taliban and Saddam Hussein. And we've got $100 a barrel oil. Why on earth should they negotiate with us um, at this point? So um, I think we, we buy time. We, I, I think it will make Iran very uncomfortable for us to break, basically stop chasing them and to use that time to reach um, a, agreement of, on, on, on new red lines that's serious. That's where I would go. Great. I'm afraid we're pretty much have exhausted our time and we've been schooled by the organizers of this wonderful global philanthropy forum to keep to the deadlines. I would like to say just in conclusion for donors in the room, I hope that you've taken from this conversation that these various kinds of track two experiences are potentially very good philanthropic investments. They do build knowledge and insight. They build relationships that can become very important in years ahead. They can also generate ideas that may have real practical utility. They give the participants an opportunity to take risks that they can't do in other settings, to offer new ideas, to offer suggestions because they're not speaking officially and to get reaction to them. But they do take time and they require patience. But on the other hand, they don't cost very much. You know, these are very inexpensive operations. You're paying essentially for airfare and hotels. And the potential payoff, if you stick with it and engage and continue to contribute, can be quite significant. So I hope this has been useful to you in thinking about how you as philanthropists might engage on a variety of different kinds of track two activities on other important international issues about conflict prevention and conflict resolution and the responsibility to protect. Thank you, Jessica and Bali, for an extraordinary conversation. And thank you all. We convene again tomorrow morning at 7.30 in this room for breakfast with people who are designated at various tables. Thank you all very much, and good night.